both themselves and, and their human companions. Um, now, the thing that used that, that I think that I, I think that I was always leaning towards writing a uh, Celtic story at some stage. But when I, and and the thing that I wanted to explore about them, I guess, was in in the in the usual in the traditional tale, they tend to be very matter of fact about the actual shedding of the skin, about the actual changing of seals into humans and back again. And you know, that there was, the fact of it was interesting enough. It was certainly enough to carry the story. But I really wanted to explore what it was like for these to, to change back and forth. And so I think I will read to you. Section um, where, and this is the, the first transformation that the witch in the story uh, wreaks upon uh, these people. And she is actually learning how to make the transformation even as she does it. Now, in the traditional tale, it's not, there isn't usually an agent who does this. They seem to spontaneously come out and decide that they're going to grow long hair so that they can comb it a bit deeper or dance upon the, the, um, the, the island. That Summer nights, or something like that. They seem to want to go and have a bit of a play in the form. Um, but in this story, there is actually a woman who is calling them out of their seal nature into human life and, um, and causing them to, to uh, charm and be charmed by the men of Mont Roll Rock Island. But this is before all that happens. This is before she realises that her powers are going to be used as instruments of revenge. This is when she's a young girl. A young and slightly lovely girl. I took flint and steel and went out, tiptoe through the town so as not to wake anyone, then out along the field road. The moon shone brightly. Perhaps that had called me out. The air was as still as a held breath. Down to the crescent I went, the crescent cove, which is the beach nearby where the seals congregate, to the seals, who are all the one silver under the moon, except for the bull, the king, who lay among his wives like spilled ink, and the babies like dark droplets thrown off him throughout the herd. I gathered driftwood and made a fire, and took off my clothes in the warmth of it, and stripped the cross bands from myself, and down I went, and called the king out from among the mothers. His waking roar echoed around the crescent rocks. He rose from the rock and pitched himself through the bewildered mans toward me, right over some of them. His eyes rolled white in the moon and his mouth was a paler slash within his dark head. There with pups moiling and mewing around my ankles and man's a fret and a waggle either side, I set my sights on the man making his inside him. Like a swarm of bright insects they were, which I must waft and persuade towards his centre, even as he lurched and shivered and made his monstrous sound and blasted me with his fish breath. This I did, this I learned to do in the doing of it, searching every corner of him, gathering every seed and spark. The full moon conjured and encouraged the light, and I threw and threw myself as one throws a net, and I drew each speck toward and into the man shape at his centre. A head blur parted from the body blur. Some limbs came good, splitting from the main shine. Then suddenly the man's outline sharpened within the seal. Arms lifted from his sides, reached up, and hands pushed out through the mouth hole and split the seal's head in coat collapsed to the rock, and the shining man stepped out. The moon lit his lifted face, and I laughed as I fell in love with it in simple accordance with the terms of the old charm. Then he lowered his gaze to me, and likewise I dazzled him. It was none of my doing, only a matter of proximity and timing and our two natures, and we were locked together. He glanced about at the sea, at the cliffs, at the fire. That is your home up there, he said. That is my fire. I admire his long, lean legs, his man parts and his narrow hips, the smooth dent in front of him, his broad chest and fine shoulders, and above all, his face, so full of strength and loveliness, and most marvellous of all, so fixed on me, with not an ounce of ill will or amusement in his eyes, not the merest sm smudge of guile in his expression, not a hint of curl in his lip. Then he bent, and I heard my own little shriek, the most girlish sound I had ever made as he lifted me. He started out among the mothers and pups, commanding them aside in their own tongue. I clung to his smooth neck, breathing in the heavy, salty warmth of his skin. A soundless wind poured up through the air around us. It should muffle everything, as crashing surf muffles the voices on a beach, as surf fumes veil the headlands.
But instead, every wave flash and seal snuffle was clearer, every rock bulked out brighter edged, and every touch was sharper or more tender than it ought to be. He lowered me to stand by the fire, to put his arms long, strong, and lean about me. I stood to my toes, and he bent from his height, and we met in the middle very sweetly, I thought, very neatly. And then I thought the kiss had finished, but still he pressed me there. And when my mouth softened, wondering at the surprise of that, oh, in he slipped his tongue a little way. I exclaimed against it. I tested and tasted him. I put up my own arms and held him down to me, and up his hot neck and into his slithering hair my fingers found their way. And in among his teeth my own tongue darted, and up and down our bodies we were passed together. He let me go as gently as he'd taken me up. Soft, smaller kisses finishing off the larger. Pushed back the curls on my forehead that was never something to being tied back. I fizzed and rushed with that kiss, quietly thundered to myself. How would I bring myself at the end to send all this back to the sea? But why think of that? I sat to the rock, drawing him down with me. I pushed him back and lay alongside him, quite unafraid. I roamed over him, exploring the hills and vales of him, the roads and towers, and with my small, plump, work-red hands, wondering at all his different degrees of hairiness and smoothness, warmth and chill, tying and loosing his hair, which was dark as night, slippery as water. And here was a wonder, that a man so well conformed himself should be so eager to embrace what I had always been told was a poorly made body, laughable, even disgusting. But I delighted him. He troubled my curves, weighed me in his hands, pressed me and gasped with me as I yielded. Open-faced, he looked into me, his eyes empty of the scorn I was used to seeing, in women's faces as well as men's. Instead, he was only another creature, discovering skin, discovering forms of limbs, folds and fancies in the fire and moonlight, all of them laughable, all of them gravely serious. He pushed the dampening hair back from my temple and kissed me again with that wide, that white teeth, that smiling, serious mouth. We barely spoke, beyond a muffled cry here and there, a little laugh, a gasp. What was there to say as we did what we did, or even as we floated in its aftermath, curled around each other in the fire's warmth, in the night's cold. Exultant, I watched as my life tore free like a kite from the string and flung itself up into the windstorm that was the future. I had been so small and stuck so fast in my little round of puny terrors. Why had I cared so much for people's opinions, people even smaller than myself? Ha, it hardly mattered why I did it if I cared no more. Look what I could have, look what I could do. The stars teased cloud veils across themselves and twinkled out brightly again after. The ample air of spring spread above, salty, green, teeming with life. The sea lipped and popped at the rock's rim, sighed farther out into the swells and tides and darkness. I turned in my lover's arms and pulled his mouth to mine.